Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Okay, great. You guys are able to hear me. Oh, Patty. Patty Montgomery is on. Okay, let me see. She's saying something. It says, Patty, why is half of your message getting cut off? It says, hey, Luz, it is Patty. I'm going to start up the study group next week. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's fantastic. So, um, I, as you guys know, Patty Montgomery, um, she's over in Washington, and she does a study group in Washington. Um, Patty, do you think you could send me your link so that way I can send it out with the study materials? Okay, perfect. So I'll be able to send that out with the study link. Great. It's so nice to hear from you. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Happy 2021. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. I, Patty says that she hopes everyone is hanging in there. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let me see. We recently had one of our team, or one of our group members pass. I'm trying to see if she's on the call. Um, I'm trying to see if Liza's on the call. Liza, are you on the call? I don't see her on here. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so uh, we recently had one of our our group members. She works in Polk County, and she recently got her CIC. It's always really exciting whenever we have someone, um, obviously, you know, who works in public health uh, and RIPs, any group member past their CIC. It's, it's a really exciting time. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a really... Look, I'm not going to say I have a favorite topic because there's just so many things that I love, but... But I do have a special place in my heart for water bugs. I think that they are so interesting. And if I was ever in a doctoral program of any sort, I would want it to focus on biofilm on medical devices or water bugs. Um, you know, it's just biofilm. I just find it so exciting. Okay. So you guys can see the PowerPoint, which is great. So today we're going to discuss chapter um, 115 which is water systems issues and prevention of waterborne infectious diseases in healthcare facilities. Okay, so pop quiz. What are the three most commonly reported waterborne pathogens? And these are ones that we see come across our list all the time and that we learn about in school um, <laughs> and that, you know, that we should know pretty well. Okay, so I also have really beautiful pictures here to remind you of all of our friends. Okay, so what is this first one? These, these guys right here. Okay, so I have some interesting things. Um, somebody said, Legionella, E. coli, crypto. No, no, it is not Legionella, it's not crypto. It's my favorite. It's my favorite water bug. <laughs> yes, Patty, it's Pseudomonas. <laughs> Pseudomonas species, very good. Okay, this next one, I'll give you guys, I'll let you take a guess first. This next one, the picture in the middle. picture in the middle. I'm not getting any answers. Okay, guys, if you get this reported in your hospital and this patient has been there for greater than, you know, in some states it's 10 days and others, it could be less than that or more than that, it would trigger an investigation. Oh, very good, Patty. You said Legionella. Okay, great. And then the last one, another waterborne bug. Looks a little bit different. Uh, 
uh, doesn't look quite like Vibrio. Doesn't look quite like it. It's another one. There's all different types for this one. Good job, Margaret. Good job, Margaret. So atypical or non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. So, you know, we have mycobacterium abscessus, mycobacterium avian complex, mycobacterium avium, um, mycobacterium marinum. My there's like, there's a whole list. You know, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, sections of the, the infection prevention is guide to the lab is on when they start talking to you about all of the different types of mycobacteria. That's a good chapter. That's a good little reading time there. Okay, so these are three of our most commonly um, discussed waterborne bugs. We talk about Pseudomonas a lot, Legionella a lot, um, and Mycobacteria as well. Acinetobacter is another one that's very common. So let's talk about water and infection control. Water-related problems are amongst the most challenging infection prevention issues involving the environment of care. And now, why is it that that these issues are so challenging? Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, knowledge, right? So that that's barrier number one right there. We need to ensure that our staff, and not just our IPs, but also our frontline staff are knowledgeable on water bugs and how they're able to get to our patients. So that requires um, education. You have to be able to educate your staff so that they know, hey, I shouldn't have things near the sink. And this happens, all the time. I mean, it happens all the time. People forget. It's not, not everyone has an IP brain. They don't, you know, it's not, that's not always their priority. And so they don't think about, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't put this right next to the sink. Um, design also has <laughs> a lot to do with some of the water problems that we encounter in healthcare. Uh, there are times when infection preventionists are not involved in decision making when it comes to new construction. Obviously, the recommendation is that we should be, but there are times when we're not, and that's how you end up getting water fountains put in the middle of lobbies, um, how you end up having sink areas that are really um, not great and end up being a perfect place for uh, nursing uh, staff to place all of their different materials right next to the sink. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of things that contribute to uh, water problems in healthcare. Prevention and control of legionella contamination of water distribution systems. This is important. So a lot of the times when you're going through questions for the CIC exam and they talk about legionella, they're gonna talk about um, temperatures. So they're gonna want you to know temperatures what temperatures does Legionella grow in? Uh, what temperatures um, do we know that we can, you know, kill Legionella, et cetera? They're also going to talk to you about water, water systems. So how well do you know your water program, your water system in your facility? And it's obviously going to be different. So it depends on the facility that you're at. If you're at a smaller facility, you know, if you're at a, you know, 40 bed LTAC versus an 800 seven story hospital, those are very different water systems. You know, if you're at a 40 bell LTAC that is just one floor, the, the way that that water is moving in that facility is going to be completely different than the way the water is going to be moving in, you know, a massive uh, hospital or organization. And so they're gonna, those are other questions that they're gonna a, um, ask you about is water systems in facilities. And then the last one is uh, remediation. So you're gonna need to know what are some of the remediation strategies that we that can take place when it comes to Legionella, okay? Water and infection control, assessing risks and developing prevention strategies. So the things that we were talking about, design considerations, routine preventative maintenance for operations and equipment, and remediation measures during floods or utility outages. And so I know that this is specifically saying remediation measures during floods or utility, utility outages, but you also have to take into consideration that remediation may be necessary if you suddenly identify a cluster of Legionella, or even if you identify just one case of um, a healthcare-associated Legionella. Okay, water disinfection and treatment options. So water disinfection and treatment options. When it comes to <laughs> when it comes to the CIC test, we need to talk about 
water disinfection and treatment options, and you need to know them. We obviously can't go over every single different type of water disinfection and treatment option because we'd be there, we'd be here forever. Uh, but this is a this is a good topic to discuss with some of your engineering folks. Um, when it comes to a response, so when it comes to a Legionella response or any other type of response that could potentially involve uh, your water system, it's going to be a collaborative uh, response. You're going to obviously have infection prevention involved, but you may have, if it's a new building, if construction is going on, you may have uh, your construction people, safety, and engineering, and they'll be able to talk to you and actually walk you through your facility and be like, these are our boilers. This is the entry point. Um, what do we do if we need to, do we hyperchlorinate? So these are things that you need to know. Understanding conditions that allow for waterborne pathogen growth and proliferation is critical to prevention and control. Now, this can get very detailed, but for the exam, they want to make sure that you know your basics. So do you know what a dead leg is? What is a dead leg? Who can tell me, you know, what a dead leg is? Describe it. Water stops. Okay. Extra pipe. Okay. So a dead leg. Let's see if I can get this. So if we have a pipe, right? And we'll say this is the main one, this one that I'm drawing now. And then you just have a little leg out here. Whoop. And here it is, it's closed. What can happen here, right? I mean, this should be blue, but this could be water. So this is a this is essentially a dead leg. Water can collect here, uh, can circulate here. It's a great place for biofilm to grow. So um, yeah, does not, okay, so we got some extra stuff. End of a water line, the water does not f flow freely. Yummy growth, <laughs> stagnation, a pipe that retains water and isn't flowing. Correct. And Yes, okay, perfect. So this is a concept that a lot of us understand and that we know. So this is this is what they're referring to, understanding conditions that allow for waterborne pathogen growth and proliferation is critical to preventing, so, so to prevent and control water bugs. Another thing, what if you have a, um, a water, here, water heater or a boiler that fails, right? That's going to affect the temperature of your water. All of these different things are important to preventing waterborne pathogens from circulating around your facility. And then consideration of water issues is an essential component of an infection control risk assessment, which is an ICRA. Um, and we actually had a consultant that spent some time with our team at you know, our team here in Florida. And one of the things that she talked about was a WICRA. <laughs> So it, it's basically an ICRA, but regarding water. And that was a really, really helpful tool. That was really great. So look at your WICRAs. Okay, so prevention strategies. Facility risk assessment for areas of potential growth and or transmission. So this is where we're trying to identify, okay, uh, is there a room that we have closed down that we should be flushing the water in because that could be causing an issue. And um, Patty Montgomery actually wrote, think about all the buildings that have been closed in the pandemic. Let's think about that. Think about all of the hotels right now who are closed. They don't have people staying in those rooms, right? And nobody's turning on those showers. I mean, hopefully they are if they have a good water management program. Um, but that if you know all of that is going to affect um people right because if you go into you know if you go to stay at a hotel you're expecting that things are going to be safe or wherever you go you're expecting for that environment to be safe whether it's a hotel whether it's a hospital um, whether it's you know a clinic a gym etc you're expecting for those places to be safe um, and if that water isn't getting flushed and that isn't being taken care of you can imagine all of the fun stuff that is growing in those pipes right now and that has been growing in those pipes for months at this point use of design strategies aimed at reducing the risk of pathogen growth or release so for example um, this could be taking a look at uh, do you have automatic faucets 
right? Or do you um, do you actually have faucets that where you use the handle? You're able to leave those um, leave you know flush those systems out. I know that there are some some people who can use you know a pipe cut up to put in front of a, of an automatic water dispenser to make sure that you're able to flush it. That's one of the things that you need to take into consideration is your 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 faucet type. So what are you using? Next thing, sink design. So how deep is your sink? Is it a really shallow sink where things are just going to come right back, splashing out into the environment? Uh, how far away is um, your patient, you know, medication preparation area from your sink? Is it the recommended, you know, length, 3.2 feet? All of these things are important when it comes to design. And when you don't involve infection prevention into this discussion, you can end up having to go back and correct a lot of things. And that's what ended up happening on one of my units where, um, you know, they said, oh, here we go, this project is over. And I'm like, um, this, this, faucet is directly hitting over the sink drain. We can't have this. Um, and we had to actually buy a different um, faucet that was a bit bigger and I, it's like longer so it wouldn't hit right over the sink drain. Compliance with maintenance practices that contribute to controlling transmission risks. This is going to fall a bit more on engineering, but also um, think about uh, damage that can happen around your sink areas. So are you going around to your units, taking a look at your sink areas and putting in those work requests to get um, to get any type of you know mold or damage fixed? Employment of remediation measures during emergencies. Obviously, we've talked about hyperchlorination. There's other monochloramines. There's all different sorts of things that you can implement. Um, but empl employment of remediation measures is something that you need to know about. And then consideration of disinfection modalities when surveillance or risk assessment indicates a need. Okay, concept check. Which of the following are the key to preventing water-related problems in healthcare facilities? One, planning for remediation in the event of a disaster. Two, a proactive risk assessment. Three, thoughtful design. Four, routine preventative maintenance. So which of those, one, two, three, and four, and you can choose multiple ones, which of the following are the key to preventing water-related problems in healthcare facilities? Okay, so we have a ton of different answers. There's a lot of like names that I've seen for a while. It's interesting to see, I, I, it's nice to see you guys. I'm seeing, you know, Fran, Stacy, Jyothi. It's nice to see y'all. Okay, so we have a lot of different answers. We have people who have selected Bs, uh, D, C, So it looks like the majority of, of the group is choosing B. All right. Okay, I completely understand why you would be inclined to choose B. I get it, I understand. But there is one word that we need to focus on and that is preventing. All right, so which of the following are the key to preventing water-related problems in healthcare facilities? So there is one question, I mean, sorry, there's one answer choice here that is really relating to response. That is really saying, this is how we're gonna respond to an issue. And I get why planning makes you think, oh, we're doing it ahead of time, but you also have to think about, hey, we have a healthcare onset Legionella case. We need to plan. What are we going to do now that we that we've identified this case? How are we going to remediate? We need to get with our with our water management um, program, figure this stuff out. So it, you know, yes, obviously you can have a plan ahead of time, but once you have that situation happen, um, things could change, right? So while I see why so many of you are leaning towards B, when we focus on prevention. 
two, three, and four are really what focuses on prevention. Um, sorry, let me, wait, oh, sorry. So a proactive risk assessment, preventative, thoughtful design, preventative, and then routine preventative maintenance, okay? So the correct answer is going to be C. All right? The correct answer would be C. Okay. Although planning must necessarily provide for remediation in the event of a disaster, natural or man-made, the key to prevention is a proactive risk assessment, thoughtful design, and routine preventative maintenance. All right. Okay, key terms. We're going to do some matching. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Patty. <laughs> We're going to do some matching with key terms. Okay, so the first one is going to be potable water. So potable water, which one on this side, A, B, C, or D, is the right definition for potable water? Okay, very good. Everybody's putting down the right answer, um, which is, D, water suitable for drinking. I always have to tell this story because there may be other people on the call and this may help you remember it on the test. Um, I actually <laughs> I actually didn't fully learn what potable water meant till I was an undergrad and I was taking a global health class. And I always, <laughs> in my head, thought potable water meant portable water. And it was just like a fancier way of saying, oh, it's portable, it's potable. Um, but uh, yeah, in my global health course, they were like, no, it's potable water means water that's suitable for drinking. And so for those of you who maybe didn't know that, now you know. I mean, obviously I learned a little bit later on in life than probably a lot of you, but it's good to know and hopefully you will not get it wrong. Okay, so next one is gray water, gray water. Okay, lots of different answers here. I have some C's, some B's, and some A's. So, and then some people saying, I honestly have no idea, and that's okay, that's why we're here. So, gray water is C, water, as from a sink or bath that does not contain serious contaminants as from toilets or diapers. So, that is gray water. Next one is black water. Okay, people are answering a little faster, right? As the choices are dwindling, majority of the group is saying black water is A, which is correct. So black water is wastewater containing sewage contaminants. Next one will be reverse osmosis water. Okay, very good. So majority of the group is putting E. So reverse osmosis water, water forced through a special membrane under pressure, which produces highly purified water, uh, typically requires remineralize, remineralizing with essential trace elements before use, used for various applications within healthcare, including in dialysis. And the very last one is deionized water, which is purified water that has had charged ions removed, used for various applications within healthcare, including the laboratory. Okay, so water delivery systems. Water delivery systems should be designed to supply water at sufficient pressure to operate all fixtures and equipment during maximum demand. Provision of two separate water lines from a looped municipal water supply system to a facility would minimize interruption of water service. So again, and okay, and this is the thing. I don't want you to think, oh, you know, I don't work at a hospital. I don't work at a 
facility, I work at the health department, or I work at a different type of place, you can still ask questions about your water supply system. There is a, trust me, there is an entry point into every building. So go talk to engineering and just go learn, just go spend some time, just say, hey, can I have an hour of your time? Or, you know, two hours of your time, if you're feeling gracious, and can we just talk about water? and learn about where is the water coming through in the hospital or at your facility where you're located, um, how does it get distributed, uh, where are your water heaters, all of this stuff is really important to learn. And you know, when, when uh, we were responding to an outbreak of VIM producing pseudomonas, one of the things that we did was water testing. And it was so interesting to just get to learn from them about their entry point into the facility. And at the time, uh, our manager, Alvina Chu, she's amazing. She came out with us and she is just, she's just such a queen. She was just pointing different things out, educating us. And she was just like, bam, 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 bam. Like it was just, just like knowledge pouring out of her. And so it's really exciting when you have the opportunity to learn from people who know more about you because then it makes, it makes you excited about, you know, learning about water. And then you get to actually hear from somebody who's passionate about, you know, what they do and water systems and the flow and all of this stuff. Okay, so general guidelines of water delivery systems. Uh, water service mains, branch mains, and other main water lines should have stop valves for each fixture. Valves isolate a portion of the water system from the remainder of the system when a repair is required. Vacuum breakers should be installed on faucets. Approved backflow prevents, uh, preventers, wait, prevents? protect water supply systems from contamination in high risk areas such as dialysis units. Oh, this is another great, this is another really great place to go ask about water flow. Where's your dialysate going? All of this stuff is really good. Floor drains should be avoided as much as possible and specifically should not be in operating or delivery rooms with the exception of dedicated cystoscopic rooms. Drainage piping should not be installed in ceilings or exposed in operating and delivering rooms, nurseries or other sensitive areas. If overhead drain piping is unavoidable, provisions must be made to protect the space below from leaks, condensation and dust particles. Water supply pipes with dead ends should be avoided or if found should be minimized. So these are general guidelines of things that you should be looking for, things that you should want to learn more about, and that you should kind of be able uh, to point out. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be able to do that on your first uh, your first time when you're going to go learn about a water system. Uh, there's lots of really good videos, um, but the best thing is really just to try to um, actually put your eyes on a water system, regardless of where you're working. Water temperature specifications. The water temperature for showers and bathing should be appropriate for comfortable use and the 2010 guidelines permit a temperature range between 105 and 120. The CDC recommends maintaining water temperatures at 124 or higher and cold water temperatures at 68 degrees Fahrenheit to control Legionella pneumophila. Concerns with scalding move uh, many building codes to limit hot water temperatures to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That is important to know. Okay, let me give you the skinny on temperatures. You're gonna get questions on temperatures, all right? And it may be on temperatures for the operating rooms and humidity for the operating rooms, or it may be on uh, the temperatures for SPD and humidity and SPD. These are what I like to call my black and white questions, okay? When you get questions related to numerical values, like a temperature, Either you know it or you don't, and that is the truth. So either you know it or you don't. If you do not know it, you make your best educated guess and you keep moving. Do not waste time on these types of questions, all right? Because I guarantee you there's gonna be another six questions that you're gonna know. So don't waste your time on black and white questions. If you don't know it, make your best educated guess and keep it moving. We don't have time for that. Basic plumbing design. Documented outbreaks have been associated with splashing back from sink drains containing contaminated biofilm, aerosols from shower heads, and contaminated potable water used with patient care equipment or directly with patients. 
IPs should understand the basic design of a water supply and waste system to provide effective input regarding plumbing system design and to understand potential factors that may contribute to suspected waterborne infections. Okay, so I always like to point this out because I think people sometimes get a little bit over their head when it comes to some of these chapters. They want us to know the basics, okay? We are not going to be experts in plumbing. I mean, if you have a background in plumbing, fantastic, but a lot of us do not have a background in plumbing. You want to make sure that as you're reading the chapter, you're taking away those key things that they want you to know. I talked about dead legs in the beginning. It's coming up again. Guess what? They want you to know about dead legs. They want you to know about dead legs on the test. You have to pick up on this stuff as you're reading the chapters. And I really try to point it out in our presentations. But trust me, a one hour presentation on water systems um, is not going to give you absolutely everything that you need to know about them. Um, and there's really nothing better than making sure you're doing your readings and that you're reading the text. It's really going to help you. Okay, so water associated pathogens. Microorganisms associated with water include Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Moraxella, Aeromonas, Xanthomonas, Legionella, Aspergillus, Fusarium species, and atypical, atypical NTM, so non tuberculous mycobacteria. All of these genera are associated with serious disease and can be potentially and can potentially be transmitted directly or indirectly from faucets and sinks or through inhalation of aerosols, such as those generated from construction activities or from shower heads. I honestly, one of my favorite um, types of outbreaks to learn about, you know, whenever you go to a conference or you're even just listening um, to lectures on YouTube, I love YouTube. YouTube is free education, like, it's amazing, um, is related to waterborne pathogens. I don't know what my obsession is <laughs> with these with these water pathogens, but I just find them so interesting and I think that they cause so many more pro problems than we realize. Like, let's talk about dental clinics, all right? And this is gonna be a one minute detour, but there is so much that can happen in a dental clinic that could result in patient harm. And I wish that there was more involvement, more education available to them. I mean, talk about water and uh, medical supplies, dental clinic, yes, hello. Um, so it's just absolutely fantastic. Um, I remember listening to a lecture where they were talking um, about an outpatient clinic um, where they were doing just like minor foot procedures, like getting rid of, you know, a little cyst here and there or other things. And I, I'll never forget, it was this picture of these, of a literal tray, it was a smaller tray opened right next to the sink where like a provider would go wash their hands and then get ready to, to do a procedure, right? There is just so many opportunities um, when it comes to preventing waterborne pathogens. Okay, so pathogens and their associations. When disease transmission from direct contact with waterborne microorganism is considered, what pathogens should you suspect? So you're gonna go ahead and type in some of the water bugs that you would think of when it's dealing with direct contact. This is a keyword. We're getting some answers. Great, 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 great. Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, Legionella. All right, so this is what we're dealing with. Pseudomonas, atypical mycobacteria, and Legionella are the most commonly reported pathogens identified. Which waterborne pathogens are most often related to outbreaks of con contaminated equipment? contaminated equipment.
Okay. Pseudomonas and atypical mycobacteria are off, often are related to contaminated equipment. So we see all of these different um, water, bugs, water bugs come up. There's obviously other ones, Burkholderia, there's a bunch of other stuff, um, but it's talking about our most common. And remember those three, those three that I pointed out in the beginning, there's a reason why I did that. <laughs> it's because they're all over the text because they want you to know about them. Okay, so true or false, inhalation of aerosols of contaminated water is the primary mechanism of transmission for Legionella, not person to person. Is this true or false? <laughs> okay, great. Everybody's putting true. Fantastic, that is true. Um, it is the primary mechanism of transmission. We're not gonna dive into that one case reported in Portugal. Next, water from flower vases has been identified as a disease risk for immunocompetent patients because potential pathogens have been isolated from such water sources. Is that true or false? Oh, Patty Montgomery. Okay, let's see who caught on to this one. Patty caught on to it. Felicia Wilson caught on to it. Very good. Okay, now keep in mind when you take your CIVIC exam, when you take your CIC, you're not gonna get true or false questions. Um, they're all gonna be, you know, multiple choice. But what I'm doing here is I'm testing your, uh, uh, your attention to detail. This is false, and there is one word that makes this statement false, and is immunocompetent. Immunocompetent. And what you'll find is that when you take your practice exams, there's going to be times when you're going to read through questions a little bit too quickly, and they're going to they're going to lead you to the wrong answer because you went through it a little bit too quickly, didn't give it the, the time that it that it really needed. So water from flower vases has been identified as, as a disease risk for immunocompromised patients, not immunocompetent patients. We have, <laughs> I'm sorry, the responses are just, you guys are so funny. Um, don't cry, don't cry Marwell, it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, yes, don't don't let yourself get tricked with these. I do it here in you know as as part of our group so that you can. I need let me get rid of this pen. I'm just putting all of these little red dots everywhere, um, so that you don't get tricked on the test. Okay, so let's talk about um your in your book in your book or on the online APEC text, depending on whatever copy you have, whether you have it in paper, whether you have it online. This goes over organisms, oh, sorry, this, these are all outbreaks. So these are the organisms that were found, Mycobacterium fortuitum, an alcoholism rehab unit, and it was the showers. It's always like a game of clue, right? When you're working an outbreak, it's like, who did it? What was it? Was it the oral chlorhexidine wash? Was it the saline? Was it the flushes? What was it? Who did it? These are all the things that you're trying to figure out. And you can see, look, Lots of Legionella pneumophila, um, lots of it. Uh, it was in an ICU kitchen ice machine, the ice machine, the water system, water distribution system, contaminated aerators. Uh, so these are all different epidemiologic factors that led to these outbreaks. And it's fun to read about them. I don't know if you guys find them fun, but I think they were so, it's so exciting to read about outbreaks especially if it's about a pathogen um, that, that, you've, that you're really interested in. Okay, so environmental sources, portable water systems and cooling towers, flush sinks, faucet aerators, hoppers and toilets, eye wash and drench shower stations, chests or ice machines, water baths, that's a, that's a good one, water baths used to thaw or warm blood products and other liquids, whirlpools or spa-like baths, all of this stuff. You just never know. 
And another thing, it's really important to have a close relationship with your lab. Work closely with your lab because sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming uh, when it comes to trying to remember, oh, where was the last time I saw Pseudomonas in ICU? Or when was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Work with your lab. Depending on the EMR system that you have, it may be easy for you to pull up those reports or it may not be. So work closely with your lab. Um, faucet aerators on sinks can enhance growth of waterborne organisms. Is this true or false? Okay, so faucet aerators on sinks can enhance the growth of waterborne organisms. Everyone's putting true. Uh, that is correct. All right. Aerators are not recommended, but if they must be used, especially in an area with immunocompromised patients, a systematic cleaning routine should be established. Now, I'm not entirely sure why an aerator would have or must must be used um because it's saying but if they must be used um not entirely sure why you would need to use one it's not recommended you really shouldn't have them uh they should uh yeah we shouldn't have those so they're saying helps with water pressure cost savings um yeah i can I can understand why a facility might be more inclined to have them, um, but there it's still not recommended that we have them. I don't know if you've ever taken off an aerator and actually looked at it after it's been there for a while. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's gross. All right, so I got 99 problems and water is one. So excessive moisture around pipes and insulation, condensation and drain pans and flooding from broken pipes can lead to extensive environmental fungal contamination. This is super important. Um, and this, a lot of this can also um, relate back to your construction and how involved you were with that. Uh, with pipes, one of the things that can happen is that uh, depending on the temperatures, there can be a lot of condensation that can form on those pipes. And then guess where that condensation goes? It falls, right? It falls um, and it, it can definitely cause a lot of damage. That's why one of the things that we look for uh, when we're rounding is you often find infection preventionists just looking up. We're just looking up and we're looking at all of the little tiles in the ceiling and trying to find, do we have a potential leak anywhere? Is there some, condensation that's falling down on these uh, on these little tiles. So all of this stuff is important. Static or stagnant water systems can serve as reservoirs of organisms in the healthcare environment by supporting bacterial growth. So think about your facility right now. Are there any units? Are there any places that you've shut down? You know, any spots in the hospital where, you know, before it used to be a hub of activity and now it's not. Is there water there, you know? This stuff is important because that water, uh, that water system is now stagnant and is providing a great place for all sorts of stuff to grow. Decorative fountains and waterfalls and water walls and water, not waterfalls, but yes, decorative fountains and water walls. Okay, so open water features such as decorative fountains and water walls may aerosolize waterborne pathogens and can present an infection risk in healthcare and non-healthcare settings. What are some issues that we run into with these types of features? Port maintenance and underwater lighting. And then the fountain design may allow for areas of water stagnation. I remember I was at a conference once, um, and it was one of our uh, epi conferences for the state and one of the one of the you know cases that was presented was they had these cases of legionella that happened very closely and you could you could see how it all had to do with this decorative water fountain um, that for a period of time had um, basically not been getting enough chlorine 
and it was really, really interesting. So we definitely, yeah, we don't, we don't like this kind of stuff in healthcare facilities. If features such as decorative water fountains or water walls are currently installed anywhere within or outside of healthcare facilities, organizations must ensure systematic disinfection and preventative maintenance is ongoing. Um, and we have some, so there's this big courtyard at the facility that I'm at, um, and it's not like, you know, it's not a patient area or anything, but there's a big courtyard outside and there's a couple fountains there. And when I walk by and I smell the chlorine, I just, it just makes me be a little bit more at peace because you can really smell it and you know that that it's doing its its job. Okay, sinks and outbreaks, another top favorite subject of mine. So proper sink design, the depth of the sink, the length of the spout, the distance between the spout and the sink drain, all of these things are key to preventing waterborne outbreaks related to sinks. There was an outbreak of Pseudomonas aeruginosa related to a shallow basin, close proximity to point of care and water that splashed from the sink to surfaces around the sink as much as one meter away. That's why our splash zone is one meter. 15 ventilated pediatric patients who became colonized with Burkholderia. Burkholderia, she's another one. She's another one, let me tell you. She was in the news this year. You guys saw that Sunstar uh, Burkholderia recall for the oral um, chlorhexidine wash? Yes, absolutely. Troublemaker, this one, Burkholderia. Um, due to the use of contaminated tap water for oral and tracheostomy care, new cases stopped once use of tap water for oral and tracheostomy care was stopped. Sinks that are small, shallow, and with a tap that directed water over the drain are not recommended. They are most definitely not recommended. Um, and you know, sometimes, Sometimes when design people are looking at um, how they want a building to look or how they want a new unit to look, they're thinking of like aesthetically pleasing things. Um, they're thinking of, oh, what's going to be pretty or what's going to look good. And sometimes the things that looked good are not good. Um, they're not good from an infection prevention standpoint. So it's really important to, to get involved. Um, let's see. Yes, Patty's saying it's so important for IPs to be involved in the design phase. Yes, because then guess what? We're coming in at the end. If you're saying, oh, okay, well, let's make sure infection prevention can check off. And then you're like, actually, peoples, this isn't going to work. It's not cute, fun, or fresh, and it's going to put our patients at risk. Absolutely not. We're going to have to fix this. And it's not fun. It's not fun to do that because then the contractors get upset and they're like, why didn't we have this discussion before? And so anyway, irrelevant, very important. Also, I wanna tell you guys know, CDC did post, and I think it's called From Plumbing to Patients. Type that in, try, type From Plumbing to Patients and then CDC, and it should pull up a document um, that they released basically talking about water and what you need to do. <laughs> IPs are a bus kill at these meetings, but scary stories liven things up. Imagine if it was your family who is the patient. Absolutely, Patty, you're absolutely right. Stationary and portable eye wash or drench shower stations. So OSHA recommends a schedule for flushing um, that follows American National Standard Institute um, recommendations for flushing the system for a three minute period each week. What do your logs look like? Are these things happening? Ice machines and outbreaks. Contaminated ice and ice machines have been implicated as sources of infection, though such reports are not common. I would say that we have enough. <laughs> Even though they may not be quote unquote common, we have plenty of reports um, letting us know ice machines are a problem. In, once, in one instance, a cryptosporidiosis outbreak was traced to an ice machine, and the source of contamination was an incontinent individual who was handling the ice. Mm. All right. One report also implicated aspiration of ice contaminated with Legionella species in a patient with a swallowing disorder. So there we go. Whirlpools and spa-like baths. Pools, whirlpools, hot tubs, and physiotherapy tanks are used in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Specific types of spa-like tubs are used in labor and delivery as 
preferred think tanks. Pseudomonas aeruginosa has been associated with hot tubs and whirlpools. Burn patients are uniquely susceptible to infection and prevention of contamination in this type of equipment has been studied extensively. Plumbing for spa baths or spa-like tubs has longer piping than that for typical whirlpools. Thus, contaminated water may become trapped after apparent draining and could be flushed into the tub during the next use. So, you know, a lot of a lot of the civic test uh, focuses on healthcare, and I'm just gonna dive, you know, switch lanes for just a minute. Um, let's think about the application of everything that we do in healthcare facilities outside of healthcare. Let's talk about how COVID-19 has brought the role of epidemiologists and infection preventionists to the forefront. I mean, we have a lot of really fantastic knowledge that could be assisting our community partners um, from preventing infections and not just in healthcare facilities. So right now we're talking about whirlpools and spa-like baths. There have been large outbreaks associated with, um, you know, hot tubs, whirlpools in gyms gyms where people go to, you know, where your, you know, your parents, your siblings could be going to these places. So there's a lot of really great information that we know. And I'm really excited to see where the field of infection prevention is going to head after, um, you know, I, I don't know when this is going to end, but um, even as it's happening, I'm, I'm just looking forward to all of the advice that we're going to be able to to give all of these different facilities to not just keep patients safe who come into hospitals, but to keep our community safe and the people that we love safe. Okay, so this is all CDC recommendations about pools. So let's do some questions. We might go over by like, you know, just like three minutes or so, but let's go ahead and do some questions. So question one, the organism most likely to be found in an outbreak related to outpatient whirlpool wound therapy would be A, coagulase negative staph, B, Streptococcus viridans, C, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or D, Hepatitis B virus. I'm not even going to give you any more time. This was a very easy one, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We don't even we don't even know these other girls for this question because they don't make any sense. So moving on, we're not going to read it. Okay, question two. Inadequate refrigeration. Of of food may permit the growth of potentially harmful microbes. Interventions to prevent the growth of pathogens due to inadequate refrigeration include, one, train personnel to recognize and implement safe maintenance of refrigerators, two, establish a method to record temperature on a regular basis, three, make daily rounds to ensure that the freezer and refrigerator are clean, four, schedule and perform regular preventative maintenance of freezer and refrigerator. So, what interventions would you choose? Three of these are correct. Okay, so we have lots of different answer choices that have been selected. Um, primarily, we have B, C, and A chosen. Those are the most popular one, and I would say it looks like C is the most popular one, which is incorrect. The correct answer is B, one, two, and four. This is one of those questions that's really um, heavily focused on, on the recommendations that the book is providing you, but that you can also kind of um, think about as an IP. So as an IP, we do not make daily rounds um, on our freezer and refrigerators to make sure that they're clean. I mean, let's talk about it. If you're at a facility, how many refrigerators do you think you have in that facility, right? I mean, it could be a lot. Now, there may be other people who are looking at that, right? But, you know, as far as infection prevention, that's not one of the things that we would be able to sustain. So, Rationale, this rationale is quite long, but this is basically going over the different things that they're recommending. Selecting, purchasing equipment for cooling or freezing, compare features that best meet the intended use, including operation range, size, location of use, cleanable surfaces, durability and maintenance, providing an accurate temperature monitoring for refrigerators and freezers, um, 
establish a method to record temperature on a regular basis. And a lot of this stuff is automated now, right? So you have some sort of um, AeroScout or some other type of program that's able to document all of these temperatures for you and sends them to this magical, wonderful place where they track all of this stuff. Um, schedule routine monitoring of, of refrigerator and freezer, freezer alarms were applicable. Test accuracy of thermometers, calibration may be required, schedule and perform regular preventative maintenance, walk-in refrigeration units may experience a condensation point of the building. Okay, all of this stuff. These are all things that they're giving you and you basically had to try to remember which one of those, which one of those is not included and the one that's not included is the daily rounding. Okay, guys, this is the black and white type of questions that I'm talking about. This is a black and white question. Either you know it or you don't. Either you know it or you don't, make your educated guess and keep it moving. So question three, the water temperature range recommended by the CDC for prevention of growth of Legionella is between 124, sorry, hot water at 124 and cold water, um, I'm sorry, I need to read this whole thing. A, hot water at 124 degrees Fahrenheit and above and cold water at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. B, hot water at 108 degrees Fahrenheit and above, and cold water at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. C, hot water at 110 degrees Fahrenheit and above, and cold water at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then D, hot water at 700, I'm sorry, <laughs> hot water at 77 degrees Fahrenheit and above, and cold water at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Okay, remember, right, remember that we um, always want to try to at least get rid of two answers if we can. If we are really kind of like a little bit confused and we're unsure, it's always helpful to get rid of two answers. So right off the bat, the ones I know I can get rid of are going to be C and D, right? These temperatures for hot water are way too low. This is way too low. Let's not even talk about over here. This is just hot mess express, right? So we should be able to get rid of C and D easily, which leaves us with either A or B. Some people are saying it's B. Some people are saying it's A. Um, they're saying B looks safer. But the correct answer is A. The correct answer is A, is at 124 degrees Fahrenheit and above, and cold water at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, remember that when we were reading about Legionella and Ammophila, when we were talking about temperatures, um, remember when they were talking about certain um, certain uh, state codes or, you know, building or whatever, will cap it at 120 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the CDC recommendation is at 124 degrees Fahrenheit. So obviously you can't follow that 124 recommendation because you may have building codes, you may have, your state may have certain guidelines to prevent scalding, um, obviously completely understandable. So the correct answer is A. All right. Okay, question four, which of the following recommendations should be made to reduce the risk of infection from sinks in patient care areas? A, sink basins should be deep enough to prevent splashing of water onto nearby patient care items. B, sink faucets should be located such that the flow of water hits the drain directly. C, sinks should be placed within two feet of the point of care to encourage frequent hand hygiene. And D, aerators should be installed on faucets to minimize the amount of splash in the sink. Okay, so Tina's saying not D. All right, yes, Tina, good job. All right, first of all, aerators, they gotta go. We don't want them, we don't know them. We may know them, but we don't want them, okay? Aerators are a no, so goodbye. See you never again. C, sinks should be placed within two feet of the point of care to encourage frequent hand hygiene. I mean, that's, it's, that's pretty close. That's pretty close to the point of care, if you ask me. Why? Because we have a one meter splash zone. So that means that if we have that sink, 
that close to our point of care area, we're going to be splashing Acinetobacter, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, um, Pseudomonas, little Burkholderia coming in hot and just splashing that all over the place. Absolutely not. No, sinks should not be placed within those two feet because we need to have it 3.2 feet away. Now, the text may not specifically say 3.2 feet. CDC says 3.2 feet because it's one meter. They may get a little bit more like it's three feet. We want to make sure it's three feet away. Okay, fine. We'll take it. Three feet, 3.2 feet. We'll take it. So C, incorrect. Sink faucets should be located such that the flow of water hits the drain directly. First of all, that's a nightmare. Um, my hair would fall out. Absolutely not. We do not want that. We absolutely do not want that. Let me tell you, if you have not listened to Dr. Tara Palmore, Dr. Tara, I cannot type with this thing. Dr. Tara Palmore's lecture, I have it up on YouTube. And it's also, if you look um, on the Excel file, you'll see it, I'll put, I put her name. She works with the NIH. She is a queen and a scholar, Dr. Tara Palmer. She talks about sinks, the parting in the drains, all of this stuff. She really touches on all of this and gives you a deeper dive into this. So the correct answer is A, sink basins should be deep enough to prevent splashing of water onto nearby patient care items. All right, um, well, we're over time, um, so I'm going to go ahead and end it here. As you guys know, obviously, you know, questions are always available um, on, the, on, the, on the Google Drive and all of this good stuff. This, this PowerPoint is already posted on there. So does anybody have any questions before we go? It is 3.03. I know many of you have other meetings to go to or you're heading home for the day. Um, so let me see if I have any questions. If not, you know, feel free to log off and then we'll see you next week. Hope this was fun. It looks like we don't have any questions. Okay, guys. We'll have a happy Friday. Oh, wait. Okay. I have, they're coming in now. Uh, how do we get the link for Patty? I'll send it out. She said that she sent me an email with the link in the flyer. So I'll include that in my email so that you guys can get signed up for her group. Has my email changed? No, it has not changed. It you should it should still be the same. I am not aware of it. <laughs> not aware of it changing. Um, hopefully the state didn't log me out again. They like to do that. Okay. I'm not receiving your emails. Well, we haven't met since like mid-December, so there hasn't been really anything recently because we obviously stopped meeting when the holidays came up. Um, so I can check. you If you're signed up, then you should be able to get them unless you have some sort of restriction with your work email. Um, but other than that, okay guys, well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, and that's it. Happy Friday. Good luck. I know there's many of you who are taking your tests soon, so good luck. I'm hoping um, to to make sure that we have more more uh, more people certified. It's so exciting. I know. Getting certified in the middle of a panoramic. <clears throat> Sorry, just kidding. Bad TikTok joke of a pandemic, obviously, guys. Okay. Goodbye. Happy Friday. See you next Friday.